Good morning, I'm Pavel Wozniak. And I'm Andrzej Romanowski. Welcome to ISS 2021. We're super happy to welcome you to Woj, and we are even more happy that so many of you are here. And uh, there's a special message for you that's actually coming from someone more important. Yes, uh, to just skip two slides. Okay, so we are here. <laughs> And uh, we would like you to uh, to see our uh, rector of the University of the Łódź University of Technology, the place we are here. So our uh, main host, uh, Rector Professor Krzysztof Józwik. Hello. Yes, Hello. He, hello. We can I, hear you. I, I think it is possible to join the conference. Do you see me? Yes, now we can see you. Okay, you'll see, but I think that the rest of the conference participant is not able to see me. Well, I am not very strongly addicted to the fact that I have to be seen by the audience, but it would be better. So please, if possible, share my face to all the participants. If possible. Yeah, I believe I believe we we can see you. Uh, our technical team is working on it, and yeah, they gave us a sign. Okay, it should be. So, uh, my, instead of the face, I think that my voice is absolutely sharing to all the participants. I welcome you very warmly, all of you, uh, in Wuch at our university, and it's a great honor to to be here with you and to be a host uh, of uh, such uh, prestige conference. Thank you, all the uh, decision makers, to agree that Lodz University of Technology is uh, uh, both co-organizer of uh, such conference. Uh, great welcome to participants that are here uh, at the area of Lodz University and uh, for all of them that are directly uh, in front of the computers. Uh, the situation is still not very clear and pandemic is in progress. So I think it, would, it is better to uh, conduct that conference in a hybrid manner. So once again, uh, I welcome you very warmly. I want... Uh, to uh, especially welcome all the authors and uh, all people preparing the presentations that uh, we've given you during the conference. My, my great thanks to the organizing committee, uh, including fantastic team of the student volunteers. And great thanks to the uh, Dean of uh, the Faculty of Chemistry, Professor Ivona, be a host of this brand new beautiful space in Alchemium building, the new one at the area of our university. And the uh, uh, chairman of the university council, it's uh, Dr. Miroslav Sopek. All of the other members of our academic community and distinguished guests, I welcome you very warmly. Uh, I'm proud and very glad that the, the, for the first time we have the honor to host the major human computer interaction conference in Łódź at our university. Uh, we, it means uh, all together as, as a university, a focus on both education, uh, teaching, learning uh, procedures and quality research. And uh, I think we conduct systematic uh, 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 human computer interaction as one of the, the few in Central Europe. We have both a research group, very strong, and a brand new master's degree in HCI uh, as a second cycle studies. We all know live in the area of artificial intelligence, but we don't want the technical aspects to take over the human factors in everyday life. So we hope that HCI will help us to keep the right balance between the two uh, the technical aspects and our human being everyday life. 
uh, I think that the conference is a beautiful time that we are able to have discussion on the scientific uh, achievements of our approach to different aspects of uh, the merit of the conference. But in the same time, it's time to have contacts to establish uh, new groups interesting in the same area of, of research and also friendships. In time of pandemia, there are some problems to have all these aspect, aspects together in one place. But I do hope it would be possible for you to visit Wuch and to be here. I invite you all very warmly to have the opportunity to see Lodz University of Technology and Wood City. I think that the program is uh, very dense and uh, beautiful and very important aspects will be mentioned or have been because you started yesterday mentioned and uh, I wish you very fruitful discussion. And beside that discussion, I uh, wish you uh, beautiful moments during that conference, especially for them who are here in Wuch. Enjoy your stay in Wuch, enjoy the conference, and enjoy our university. All the best for you, and thank you for inviting me to have the possibility to give a short speech to all the participants of the conference. Thank you, dear chairmen. Once again, thank you. For you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Rector. Uh, thank you for this uh, welcome message. And now we would like to share with you uh, a little bit of information on the background and the results of our conference that is now being started. Thank you very much. So let me just grab that one. Um, Good. So as, as you might know, we have a lot of people here. These are actually the wrong numbers. We had we had five people register earlier two days. We have 58 virtual participants and 29 of you here online. And I want to thank you once again for supporting our community, coming to a conference virtually or in person, uh, despite all the hardships that you are facing currently. We are a hybrid conference and we are, as, as far as I know, the first Sikai hybrid conference. So there's a lot of stuff it will be new new for you this year and we hope that it will be fun and we also hope that you will uh see how you can have fun at a, at a hybrid conference on the other hand of course we're learning how to run a hybrid conference no one has really done this in our community before so we apologize for all the hiccups in advance as you might also know uh the iss program traditionally con consists of different parts so we had workshops we had full papers posters uh, and demos this year. And these four tracks make up uh, the scientific content of ISS. So as the majority of you actually may have seen yesterday, we had a wonderful workshop uh, and the participants uh, debated for over eight hours on different issues in mixed and cross reality. Uh, and I, they seem to have enjoyed the, the workshop and they, they're even laughing. So uh, that was a great start to, to ISS. And of course, the core of the conference uh, are the papers. And as you, as you might know, we now publish our proceedings and, and proceedings of the ACM on human computer interaction. And that takes a lot of work. Uh, and here this year, uh, we had four people ensuring that the papers are aware of high quality and uh, they and ensuring that the process of selecting the papers was as good as possible. So these were Mortenfeld from Chalmers, Petra Eisenberg from India, Hans Christian Yetter from Lübeck, and our PAGM editor Mark Hancock, who oversees the process over multiple years. And I would like to give them a big round of applause right now because they did an amazing job to get us all here. <laughs> And to give you a scoop of what's coming up and talk a bit more about the papers programs is Christian. Yes, uh, thank you and welcome to uh, the ISS 2021 papers program. And I'm very proud that uh, we have selected a high quality range of um, presentations and uh, publications here. So 
Let me talk, uh, give you some key facts. So we have 23 accepted papers here at ISS 2021. Uh, they were selected from 77 submissions. So we arrived at a acceptance rate just below 30%. And uh, as uh, Pavel mentioned, that was a lot of hard work to select the best papers from the submissions. And this hard work was done by 40 associate editors and over 140 external reviews. All of the accepted papers are published in the proceedings of the ACM on human computer interaction, HECM HCI, if you are not used to this abbreviation yet, and in the ISS issue of that journal. They are already published in the ACM Digital Library. So whenever you see an announcement of a talk on the conference website with a small ACM Digital Library logo, you can click on it and access the full paper. Uh, right away. Um, so we will have 21 paper presentations during seven sessions in the next three days. And let me talk a little bit about uh, where these papers come from. So we uh, received 19 submissions during the winter round until February and 58 submissions until uh, July in the summer round. And as you can see, the acceptance rate in the summer round is a little higher. Please do not take that as an advice to only submit to the summer round. Please use the opportunity to submit your work already in the winter round for ISS 2022. So you have the opportunity to revise your work, to improve your work, and then have an even better paper in the summer round. Um, when we also look at the geographic distribution of the papers, I think it's really nice to see that ISS really reaches a global audience. If you look at this, uh, at this map, you see there's a wide geographic spread, 77 submissions from 23 different countries and four different continents. Of course, this is a little narrower if you look at the accepted papers, but still there are uh, 11 different countries and four continents with uh, Japan and Canada in the lead of papers per country. And what I think is also really uh, noteworthy here is that ISS clearly values collaboration. So we, on average, we had 4.8 authors per paper and on average 1.3 countries per paper. So I think this indicates also that ISS brings people and also countries together, which I think is a really nice thing. Um, I should not forget to talk about awards. There will be awards. So the members of the ISS steering committee and the ISS 2021 papers chairs have selected two best paper awards, three honorable mention awards. And there's also the ISS 10 years impact award. So the best paper and honorable mention awards will be announced during the conference dinner on Tuesday evening. And there will also be the 10 years, 10 years impact award being announced today at during tonight's town hall meeting. So please don't miss those interesting events. Okay, and with that, I'd like to hand over to Pablo again. Thank you very much, Christian. So, uh... As you might recall, in early years in ISS, we've had a track that we called application papers. And with the move to PACM, we sort of lost that because there's a different process required for PACM. So what we try to do uh, is we try to bring back the interaction with practitioners to our conference. And we did get uh, a case study track going. And we got one amazing case study that you will see later today. And uh, hopefully we will return to uh, having more and more practitioner involvement in uh, ISS. We also have our traditional adjunct program, so demos and posters. And this year we have seven posters and two demos, and you will be able to experience them uh, in the demo and poster session uh, later today. And we've pr we've prepared different kinds of possibilities for you to, to meet and interact with the office. So don't forget uh, to come to the poster reception today. Uh, there will be food as well, so I think uh, there's a chance you might actually enjoy this. And of course, at this point, I would also like to thank all of our chairs who uh, managed to get us a lovely program in case studies, posters, and demos. Okay, so uh, uh, safety, your safety is our priority. So uh, please take your time to uh, think about uh, COVID. Uh, uh, protocol, COVID safety protocol. This is uh, obligatory to wear uh, protective masks in all the buildings, inside the buildings. And please use the disinfection um, uh, stations to, uh, to dis disinfect the hands at the entrances. Uh, we are actually running a little bit of uh, out of time, so uh, we will go further. 
uh, as you already know, this is a hybrid uh, uh, attempt to conference for, for, for the very first time, uh, both for us and probably for you. Uh, we will uh, do uh, anything uh, possible to uh, include anyone here on site and uh, on the Zoom. All the session will take place on Zoom. Uh, there will be possibility to post your questions on the chat. Uh, we, uh, with our fantastic team of uh, technical uh, guys, uh, will try to uh, post the videos of the talks as soon as possible after the uh, sessions. And uh, you can also be able to post questions after the sessions uh, as YouTube comments uh, to these videos. Uh, the only uh, in-person only event not transmitted will be the, the tomorrow's uh, conference dinner. Uh, for those uh, sitting in this room, uh, there is an important thing. All of the uh, seats are equipped with microphones and there is a, a button to unmute and mute uh, when uh, uh, you would like to ask questions. So probably you will uh, enjoy this uh, thing after the first uh, session. Um, so if you want to get a question and you want the virtual people to actually hear it, you have to press the button. And most importantly, you have to press it again when you're done with your question. Yeah, we also have a, a nuclear uh, option uh, with a, a super power button here to uh, mute everyone. So whenever you hear this sound, it will be uh, uh, all participants will be muted. Uh, we also, uh, as our rector said, uh, would like to give you a, a chance for some social activities. First of all, today we'll have a, a poster and demo reception in the afternoon. Uh, tomorrow we are going to visit uh, another a nice uh, uh, area of our city for the conference uh, dinner uh, in the old factory. We have a lot of old factories refurbished uh, to uh, new uh, challenges in our city. And we also prepared two guided tours uh, uh, today and tomorrow. Uh, they will start at 1.30, uh, half past one. So if you would like to join this and I hope you uh, will have time and uh, and uh, would like to to do it uh, please uh, be uh, uh, punctual um maybe i will hand it to pablo now so another very important aspect of conferencing uh, both virtually and in person is respecting each other and as, as you might know our uh, organization that's organizing this conference sikai is, is and, and and it's uh, mother organization acm uh, they have a very strict policy against harassment and against not respecting people. So we would just like you to remind you of this and, re and most importantly, uh, remind you that if, in case anything happens, in case you, you experience any inappropriate behavior, it's very important that we talk about these things in our community and it's very important that we report these things in this community. And Marit, our diversity chair is here, if you want to address any, uh, she's over there, you can, uh, and for those of you att attending virtually, it's probably easier to um, address her by email. Also, uh, if you would like to uh, address any concerns anonymously, you can uh, you, you, you can you can also contact us by email. And if you would like to talk to any of our chairs about any issues, uh, we are always there for you. There's no space for uh, any kind of inappropriate behavior at this conference. The other place where you may get help, and this not, not only applies to inappropriate behavior, but all kinds of concerns like being lost or needing food or coffee, are uh, our student volunteers. And uh, we also got them lovely t-shirts, so if you spot that t-shirt, and I, if we have people in t-shirts, can I have them stand up for a while? Uh, I can see Jacob is over there and Michael is over there. So these are the, these, these are the people that will give you help if, you, uh, if you're lost or if, if, you sort of, if something's uh, uh, wrong hopefully not much uh they will come and to your rescue essentially and they are and, and they are there and always happy to help and always with a smile thank you so much don't forget that we're on social media we're putting uh stuff on the social media very regularly uh, uh social media chairs sarah and laya are, are out there uh, posting all kinds of stuff but if you post your own stuff don't forget a hashtag don't forget we have a twitter handle don't forget we're on facebook so that also the people uh, who are not here in the room can can get a glimpse of what we're up to. And last but not least, we'd like to thank all our sponsors and people who helped us organize this conference. So it's Wood University of Technology, ACM, 
the local ACM chapter, the Polish Information Processing Society, and SIGCHI. Uh, thank you, Paweł. Uh, we are a little bit, uh, you know, uh, delayed, but uh, I'm, I'm concerned because we are eating the time devoted to our magnificent speaker, uh, the opening keynote speaker, uh, Professor Władysław Duch. Uh, I uh, have a long list of his achievements. I would uh, try to uh, shorten down a little bit, but uh, I need to say a few words. Uh, uh, so, um, Wodek Duch is a head of neuroinformatics and artificial intelligence group at the University Center of Excellence for Dynamics, Mathematical Analysis, and Artificial Intelligence at the uh, Nicolas Copernicus University uh, in Poland, in Torun. Uh, Professor Duch is a truly uh, interdisciplinary scientist with a diverse background. Uh, he graduated uh, in physics with uh, highest possible honors in 1977, uh, but his PhD was associated with quantum chemistry and again awarded this time by the Ministry of Education in 1980. Then his habilitation again uh, was related to physics, but also uh, uh, to applied mathematics in 1987. And then eventually uh, he received his uh, tenure professorship uh, title in theoretical physics and uh, informatics in 1997. Throughout the years, he collaborated and, and uh, worked with many institutions, uh, institutions around the globe. I would just uh, name a few uh, as uh, University of Southern California, US, Max Planck Institutes uh, in Germany, uh, University of Alberta in Canada, Niang Yang uh, Technological University in, Sing in Singapore, and, and many, many more. But in parallel, he was always uh, uh, was loyal to his alma mater, that is the Nicolas uh, Copernicus University. Uh, for eight years now, he's been running a neurocognitive laboratory uh, where he researches uh, different approaches to neurosciences uh, in order to understand how our brains operate and how they cause uh, different type of behaviors. Uh, he authored numerous uh, research papers, but also it is worth to emphasize he's a, a, a really uh, enlightening person, so he also uh, uh, published more than 200 uh, popular science uh, articles and he's also a practitioner with a record of specialized software development uh, he is expert in numerous fields uh, just to name uh, artificial intelligence as the most let's say popular nowadays uh, and as our hci community stands at the intersection of uh, among the other fields uh, computing and cognitive uh, sciences, uh, I believe we can draw a lot of uh, inspiration and benefit from meeting this outstanding uh, researcher. We hope to have him on site here in Wuch at our conference venue, but pandemic actually uh, changed, changed it uh, into a virtual meeting, but, uh, but we, uh, we admire his with us. So uh, please help me welcome Professor uh, Wodisław Duch to our virtual, virtual stage with a round of a big applause. Well, thank you, Vodek. The floor is yours. Left? Do I have any time left after all this announcement? Yes, yes, that? yes. You can yeah, oh. proceed right away. <laughs> okay. Uh, I need to share my screen and um, I can do it now. Okay. So um, I'm, I'm very sorry that I'm not, not with you today. Uh, but, you know, my last name in all Slavic languages is Duch, which means a ghost or a spirit. So it's very appropriate that I appear in the virtual space today. And I'm, I'm very happy to hear about this uh, HCI activities in Łódź. This is something that we certainly need in Poland. And it overlaps with many things that we would like to do. Um, looking at how brains work and how we can use this for better HCI. So I want to talk about human enhancement and the future of the brain computer interfaces. And um, some of you may remember Moody Blue's very old record, about 40, 50 years old now, on the threshold of a dream. And I feel that we are right now on the threshold of a dream because we have technology that will allow us to interact directly with our brains. 
there are many global brain neurotechnology initiatives now and uh, lots of uh, research on human enhancement and the optimization of some brain processes. And uh, well, the new types of uh, brain computer interfaces, which are closed loop brain computer brain interfaces are coming. All this uh, hinges on understanding brain activity, brain processes, brain networks. And so very important part is of course, understanding how to read the brain states, the fingerprints of mental activity and neurotechnology. And of course, we need lots of uh, machine learning AI and signal processing to be able to do that. I've been thinking about these things uh, since uh, quite a long time. Uh, in 96, I published a very strange paper, Computational Physics of the Mind in Computer Physics Communication. Uh, the editor wrote that it's very unusual, but they still have published that. Um, and recently I've been also writing about memetics, neural models of conspiracy theories and other things like that. So lots of uh, things uh, around these, these topics. Well, uh, this is a mission impossible, how to develop full human potential. Uh, the neurocognitive approach is to understand the brain, that is the diagnostic part, to see how brains work, especially those that are damaged or underdeveloped somehow. Uh, how to influence the development, this is the main topic of your conference now, uh, the infant research, for example, and how we can influence infant brain development increase the efficiency of the therapeutic procedures and uh, all kinds of procedures that influence our well-being. And then uh, sometimes we can consciously control our brain states, especially if we suffer from some disorders. And then of course, some of this knowledge is going to help us to create artificial brains. So there are great opportunities, lots of dangers. And, uh, you can think about what we try to do uh, in uh, the uh, description of uh, Daniel Kahneman, who's got the Nobel Prize uh, uh, in economics uh, and has written a very nice book, Thinking Fast and Slow, that there are two systems. One is this fast automatic, uh, well, uh, uh, emotional, stereotypic, rigid, associative, responsible for perception. Lots of processes that go on and are subconscious. And then there is this conscious, slow, effortful, infrequent, logical and calculating reasoning and conscious processes that sometimes we would like to use to control these automatic processes, which are not always optimal. So IEEE has created uh, this brain initiative and lots of societies have joined that. Uh, Human Brain Project has been the flagship project in European Union since 2013. One billion euro is devoted to development of the Human Brain Project. Uh, in the US, the Obama Brain Initiative has started about the same time and uh, it has the acronym brain, brain research through advancing innovative technologies, neurotechnologies. So lots of things going around these uh, neurotechnologies now that can actually help us to interact directly um, with the brain and the environment. The, the mission of IEEE Brain is to facilitate cross-disciplinary collaboration and coordination to advance research in the development of the neuroscience and neurotechnologies of all sorts. So many companies have joined and many societies of IEEE, including Computational Intelligence Society, which was my society where I, I was mostly active, but uh, most of the societies of IEEE has joined and ACM also is contributing to this effort. Uh, Microsoft is also contributing, creating all kinds of uh, new technologies for people with some disabilities. So human enhancement and optimization of brain processes can be, uh, well, very simple. Uh, for example, we wear glasses, all kinds of glasses, uh, but some people uh, wear actually uh, hearing aids and some people have cochlear implants, which are directly transmitting uh, the sound uh, into their nervous system. Uh, and some people are using all kinds of, of rings and uh, um, uh, maybe watches and other things. But more sophisticated things are coming like artificial retina uh, uh, and uh, things like the deep brain stimulation, etc. So improving senses, eyes, ears, uh, touch, balance, memory and attention skills 
this is all enhancing our perception. Uh, one thing that, that we've been working on for, for some time now is to technologies that can sharpen your brain. We found that actually um, some children, especially, um, for example, Japanese children or um, Far East children, uh, where the language does not have phonetic contrast that are very important for uh, well, languages like Polish or, or English, uh, need some special simulation to improve phonematic hearing. So I've created a baby lab at, uh, at, at our place and uh, we started to work on gaze interactions of uh, infants that still cannot uh, control their movements too well, but also uh, can cannot express themselves speaking. And so uh, my friend Jacek Matulewski working in this lab and Viviana Bauer have created a, a gaze interaction markup language and uh, an interpreter for this language, which is called the GCAF, the Gaze Control Application Framework, that allows us to make all kinds of applications where children just watch things and um, initiate certain stimuli, which then we can observe whether they uh, interpret correctly. And this gives us kind of a feedback and chance to actually um, create um, environments that can stimulate children and help them to develop their potential, especially uh, related to phonematic hearing. So this grew up into a system that is now used for people who are paralyzed with various uh, disabilities, spastic people, people that were uh, uh, the walk up from coma, for example, and we have applications like MoveEye uh, that allows them to control YouTube and select different things. And uh, uh, we've tested different kind of keyboard types, um, including molecular keyboards and two-step keyboards, etc. Uh, some of it has been uh, presented on the eye tracking uh, conferences and co-game conferences. Uh, which are very much related to human computer interaction. But this is still uh, one application uh, related just to eye tracking. Lots of other applications that you may find now um, uh, relate to different senses. For example, some people fall because they don't have enough stimulation from their feet or the soles of their feet. And so people have invented this vibraphotics uh, kind of soles that will vibrate and give people more information about uh, the pressure uh, in your feet. Uh, and so they can control their movements and don't fall that um, frequently. But in some cases, you have uh, you have problems which uh, are related to peripheral neuropathy. So the, the nerves are not conducting signals up the body uh, from the souls. And so people have invented this walk scenes, which just sent information from the pressure sensors in your uh, shoes to, uh, well, somewhere above the ankle. And that comes to the to the brain and, and helps them to walk. Um, other simple things are related to, let's say, um, uh, recognizing your mood by having a few electrodes and EEG to find out how the songs that system has has uh, selected for you are influencing your mood. This is called mellow mind. Um, other things are related to attention. Uh, where you want to focus, for example, in a, in a complex environment, you would like to pay attention. Now, paying attention means that your prefrontal cortex has to send information to your visual and other uh, sensory areas to keep them running. And this requires effort and it's uh, tiring. And from time to time, people just relax a bit. Now, if you just run some currents through these areas, they are, uh, they are actually aroused all the time. And so this direct current stimulation systems and also stimulation with, uh, with magnetic pulses, the TMS, uh, are quite useful for this kind of applications. And so there are now journals on brain stimulation uh, where they consider all kinds of stimulations, electrical, magnetic, radio wave, uh, ultrasound, focal targets, uh, pharmacological stimulation, et cetera. And there are the brain stimulations, of course, for people with Parkinson, especially. And, uh, they are done in, in, in our clinics here uh, in, in Torun and Bydgoszcz. Um, and for people who suffer from uh, uh, well, OCD, uh, uh, the coma, persistent pain, and many other conditions. So uh, now people experiment with non-invasive approach using ultrasound um, uh, that uh, helps to 
achieve similar, uh, similar goals, but that does not require implanting electrodes very deep in the brain. We've, we've been discussing that with, with neuroscientists. Unfortunately, these projects, uh, if you want to make a, a bigger scale project, are very costly, and so we still haven't started anything. But uh, about 1% of people and some animals, like my cat, for example, suffer from epilepsy. And sometimes the epilepsy is not really uh, um, uh, reacting to uh, pharmacological treatment. And so people have um, um, developed neurostimulation systems where you have electrodes um, in the region where the um, uh, epileptic uh, attacks start and lead to seizures. And then you have some electronics that try to pick up the signals. Okay, it's starting, so let's inhibit that. And uh, this system, uh, the RNS system is now commercial and um, can actually stop epileptic seizures be before they start. So uh, that's another kind of uh, uh, human machine interaction or electronics inter interaction. And then there are, there are really crazy projects like Ted Berger from my old University of Southern California, uh, who started a company called Kernel. Uh, they've tested on rats, monkeys, and now people are uh, memory implants. So a part of deep part of the brain called uh, CA3 area in hippocampus is cut out and put, uh, and some electronics uh, is replacing the transformation of signals coming in and coming out. And um, in recent papers, they've claimed that uh, the improvement of memory is at the level of 35%. And so DARPA has also initiated uh, all kinds of new um, neuromodulation and um, brain reading projects. So lots of these things related to neuromodulation show that we can now try to influence, at least in case of serious problems like OCD, Parkinson, uh, tremors, uh, uh, I mean, all kinds of chronic pain, uh, but also depression and epilepsy, etc. Uh, we can influence the brain and try to optimize how the brain is working. Okay, technology is developing and one part of it, which is the oldest part, uh, I've, I've written a paper on that in, in popular journal 40 years ago, uh, is called neurofeedback, of course, right? So um, uh, we need to show people through the senses, uh, stimulating their senses, what happens in their brain. So we need to read that uh, and we can read that in many different ways and then present that in a form uh, that we can experience consciously through our senses. And uh, uh, neurofeedback may actually repair your network if you just put people in the scanner. Unfortunately, the scanner, uh, well, is rather a costly device, uh, about $2 million. And then uh, of course, using it is also quite costly. Then you need a supercomputer to um, uh, run the real-time reconstruction of what happens in the brain. Then you have to extract the signals from um, uh, the measurements and then calculate how much information uh, flow or uh, how strongly synchronized different brain areas are. And you can find out which uh, uh, brain pathways are not sending enough information, create some kind of index and present that in uh, a way that people can recognize uh, consciously. And that is a kind of neurofeedback that is really quite helpful and works. There are two kinds of neurofeedback that we would like to uh, have. Uh, right now, the neurofeedback that people have with uh, EEG is basically based on the power, like alpha or theta band wave power. Uh, but this is an old technique and not very effective. And in the meantime, people working on fMRI techniques have come up with uh, what they call the DECNAF. This is the, the work of Kawata Group in, in, in Kyoto. Uh, and um, in this case, they look at the targeted activity brain pattern of healthy people compared that with uh, people uh, uh, who uh, they would like to um, change this activity and uh, then give the index which is based on similarity of how far are we from more optimal uh, brain um, activity patterns. And this is decoding the local uh, uh, activity or regions. And the other one is that we would like to have a stronger connectivity between different subnetworks in different parts of the brain. And so the connectivity neurofeedback is something 
which is also very useful. And uh, unfortunately, it works quite well for uh, treatment of some uh, disease like autism, depression, schizophrenia, etc. But uh, it requires uh, a scanner. It's, it's kind of neurofeedback um, based on uh, functional uh, magnetic resonance. So. People thought uh, about this uh, idea and called them closed loop systems. Uh, in closed loop systems, we have to record what brain is doing, decode that somehow, and code stimulation and uh, stimulate the brain. And this can have lots of different applications, of course, uh, like controlling uh, the artificial limbs, et cetera, but it can also help in neurofeedback uh, treating different uh, brain um, disorders lots of things that we can now use, uh, mostly um, uh, currents, uh, so the uh, transcranial direct current stimulation systems, which are relatively inexpensive, and then uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation systems, which are a bit more complex uh, and requires lots of power in these uh, coils. Uh, and also people uh, are using the vagus nerve stimulation, which is just in the neck, peripheral stimulation, and try to use uh, uh, ultrasound, laser, etc. Lots of things uh, uh, that we have our, at our disposal. Unfortunately, all of this requires uh, close collaboration with neurologists. <laughs> we just cannot do these kind of experiments on our own. So the big question is why, why this works, neuromodulations and feedback, and nobody really knows that. But there are lots of results showing that neurorehabilitation is possible. Uh, mechanism is unknown, but maybe it's just changing activation of threshold of neurons, which is sensitization uh, that will change the way brain network work. Uh, and maybe it's just uh, that neuromodulation leads to changes in cardiovascular coupling. So there is more blood coming, coming to certain brain regions. And so they work more intensively. This can be tested. For example, we've been talking with, uh, uh, with Professor Bernhard Sabel in Magdeburg uh, about using his transorbital alternating current microstimulation device that they use to restore uh, uh, some uh, of the uh, vision, uh, low vision. He has written a book about that. So far, we haven't got the money for this project, but I think it's extremely important to understand the processes behind all this, because then we can devise a better way of using neuromodulation and neurofeedback. The neurofeedback mechanism seems to be rather complex, and there is just one paper that I found which has a model of what can be happening, but there is no proof that it, it's really a good model at the moment. So lots of things to be done. So brain-computer interfaces now. Uh, well, we can capture some signals like EEG signals, uh, extract some features and try to use that to control wheelchairs, to improve our performance, uh, to restore certain uh, functions, to uh, enhance driving experiences by, for example, uh, warning that we are drowsy, uh, supplement or uh, do the research, uh, supplement some, uh, some uh, activities and functions, etc. And it could be invasive if we have a brain implant, like in case of deep brain stimulation. It could be partially invasive, like in case of electrocorticography, and it could be completely non-invasive, which is usually EEG or um, other um, techniques uh, uh, like the uh, monitoring of, of, of infrared, uh, uh, etc. So um, unfortunately, all this is rather complex. That is, uh, the signal processing is complex, and then lots of machine learning, and finally we read the brain states and interpret them as, well, uh, some kind of uh, decisions, like we go left, we go right, we move, uh, we move our fingers, etc. What people try to do with this, uh, with this closed loop, is to read uh, the brain states of experts and then activate similar brain states of novice. Uh, and the US Army has been using system which is called Intific Neuro EST for a while. So the expert knows how to behave in a complex environment like uh, urban fights um, and the novice has to learn. And so people try to transfer learning uh, or knowledge of or, or skill uh, from experts to novice. And uh, these type of devices may have like 100 channels uh, and uh, lots of things are going to happen in this, re in this area as, as you will see in a moment. Uh, so um, uh, for 
doing things like that, you need a nice cap, uh, which has uh, EEG sensors and some of these uh, direct color and stimulation sensors, which are red here. Uh, and it could be used to, uh, well, duplicate states in other brains, uh, treatment of depression, neuroplasticity, um, changes that help to alleviate pain, psychosomatic disorders, etc. And then it can, uh, uh, well, actually have lots of electrodes now, 256 electrodes, for example, to, to, to induce the, the, these uh, changes in the brain. Uh, so consumer EEG, the simple EEG that you can buy, is now quite big, uh, uh, but these EEGs have few channels and are not the uh, uh, devices useful for research. They're more like for gaming. Uh, then the combination of virtual reality with EEG is also coming. Lots of people know uh, on the market where uh, you have um, EEG uh, or maybe NIRS, the, the near infrared systems, and um, uh, coupled with some visualization in 3D uh, in virtual reality. Uh, this is quite interesting, and we have a group of students actually that got together, and there was a big hackathon uh, in the spring school organized by GTEC in, in Austria, which is a big company uh, producing all kinds of EG equipment. They've got the uh, first place uh, for kind of a closed loop simulation stimulation that is based on neural beats on the uh, uh, auditory uh, uh, activity stimulation and then reading EG and then changing the stimulation. And then students also have organized in May a neuro hackathon in our place uh, uh, with uh, people from all over the world uh, creating uh, teams and then uh, working on some applications uh, that they had to do in uh, 24 hours. Okay, so partially invasive uh, interfaces are really great because electrocorticography and, uh, 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 will read the, uh, uh, the uh, cortical activity directly from cortex. But unfortunately, there are not too many volunteers who would like their brains to be open. Uh, if you have that, uh, you can actually uh, treat the epilepsy, OCD, the obsessive compulsive disorders, or lots of phobias and other things like that. It's quite effective. Lots of uh, work is, is being done, but unfortunately only in case of people who have either epilepsy, which cannot be treated um, uh, in the usual pharmacological way, or uh, have some kind of brain tumor where they, they will put uh, also this kind of a mesh, et cetera. So this allows people to control themselves by running also currents. Uh, so you have a handheld device and you can actually change this, the state of your brain in a conscious way. And then are, of course, there are, there are those new projects like DARPA projects in neural engineering system design or electrical prescriptions as they call them, uh, which should enable artificial modulation of peripheral nerves to restore healthy patterns of signals in, in neural circuits, et cetera. There is the Elon Musk with his Neuralink where he makes a lot of press and noise, uh, but is still rather far from uh, real applications with humans. And there are really incredible projects with neural dust, very small devices, which are like grains of sand or uh, um, uh, microscopic wireless sensors that can be implanted in the brain and then send the signals. So you don't need the wires, but uh, you, you have to have them implanted in the brain. Now, having that, what will that give you? Well, uh, lots of things related to this targeted neuroplasticity training. This is what DARPA tries to do, and that will enhance our human computer interaction very much. Uh, but if you have the nanowires, just uh, experiments on monkeys showed that if you have 205 neurons monitored with this very thin nanowires and you have the spikes of these neurons uh, uh, where they, they just read the, the activity of um, selected uh, neurons, uh, you can decode from the spikes uh, almost exactly what the monkey sees which is quite incredible. Just 205 neurons are sufficient to collect information in the form of spike distribution that can be used uh, uh, with machine learning to recreate the faces that monkey sees. And it's almost perfect recreation. And you may find neurons which will react only to deformation of these faces along certain uh, uh, well components or deformation uh, types. 
it's not the uh, principal component analysis. It's not the uh, uh, ICA, the uh, independent component analysis. It's 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 a bit different, but it's it's still similar. So uh, 205 neurons. It's incredible. And then you can also implant these kind of nanowires in the motor cortex and inject to the motor cortex of a monkey information how to behave. So lots of these things are coming. And if you think. This is still very impractical uh, because you cannot do it with humans. Well, here is a mobile deep brain recording uh, that, that also includes this st stimulation platform and you can carry it around. It's still four kilo, <laughs> but <laughs> this came out last year. So you can have virtual reality, you can have uh, brain reading, you can have brain stimulation, everything in one place. Now, how that will look 10 years from now, you can only imagine. So, to do something useful with this, we have to understand some of the brain processes which go on quite deeply. And this is what we've been concentrating on. The way you do it is that first you have to look at what are structural connections, uh, which parts of the brain are connected by the axons. Uh, what are the functional connections? That is, which parts of the brain uh, uh, work together in synchronous way somehow. You look in the scanner at different patches of the brain and look how the signal changes there and look how the signals is correlated. You look at the correlation matrix, you simplify that uh, because there is lots of noise and create kind of graphs that show you what connects to what and how these uh, subnetworks are uh, activated depending on the task. This is what people have been doing. And with the structural connections or functional dynamic connections, they find that there are big differences between people with, for example, autism spectrum disorder and the, the control people. This is the control. This is the autism. You see lots of uh, very weak connections. Uh, and uh, some other diseases like uh, tuberous sclerosis have even less uh, strong connections and look very bad. And so we know that analyzing connectomes, analyzing these connections, we can find out that certain things are wrong. Uh, we would like to uh, increase the information flow uh, where it's very weak. And so people in Japan have shown that if you have people with, let's say, autism spectrum disorder and typical people, you just look at this correlation matrix, you look at where the information flow is weaker or synchronization between which parts of the brain is weaker in case of ASD, and you can combine this information and have an index which allowed them to have 85% of accuracy uh, uh, predicting uh, which patient is uh, typical and which has ASD. And uh, they just took the same system to US to very different population, different scanners, etc. The prediction is slightly lower, but it's still 75%. So we can have indices which are based on the information flow in the brain that can objectively tell you how uh, strongly uh, this uh, activity of the brain uh, is connected to some things like HDHD, uh, the ASD, schizophrenia, major depression, and other things like that. So the idea is that the functional connectivity can actually be used as a kind of uh, biologic biologically meaningful uh, index uh, that will create a a certain space in which you can say, okay, I mean, these diseases may be really continuous. It's not that, that this is sharply schizophrenia, this is sharply um, depression or ASD, etc. We are somewhere in the space, but we have to learn how to characterize the space uh, in which uh, our cognition can be placed. We can be in the space which is roughly normal, but somehow a bit depressive, somehow a bit uh, autistic, somehow uh, a bit uh, obsessive uh, compensatory uh, or, or even schizophrenic. And so uh, this is the first time that we learn how to make objective diagnosis. And at the same time, we learn how to interact with this. And so the National Institute of Mental Health has created this uh, research domain uh, uh, matrix, uh, uh, which uh, shows different large scale systems related to cognition, controlling things like attention, perception, language, uh, memory, etc., uh, to uh, all kinds of, of affect negative valence uh, related to loss, frustration, or positive to reward, 
uh, 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 expectancy, etc., arousal regulations and social processes regulation. And so they have a huge matrix where they want to put all the information about uh, the, the genes, molecules, drugs, uh, uh, cells, uh, and then behavior, um, and then also these networks. And so Lots of work has been now done to show that this kind of closed loop systems actually can improve learning in some, in some ways. Uh, there is a paper on externally induced frontoparietal synchronization that will modulate network dynamics, enhance working memory performance, et cetera. And there are all kinds of things related to natural brain information interfaces, which will recommend relevant uh, human brain uh, uh, the information by picking up human brain signals. The army is also using things like that. If you just notice something your brain may notice, but it may not reach your consciousness. And so you have to tell yourself that, okay, my brain has noticed something. Uh, lots of other papers that I don't have time to, to uh, talk about, but basically uh, trying to synchronize better the frontoparietal uh, areas uh, in, the, in the top of the head and the front of the head will increase the working memory capacity and will increase your ability to solve problems. This has been demonstrated by uh, synchronizing these, uh, these processes with alternative currents uh, directly. So uh, this is a very nice, <laughs> nice uh, direction uh, for learning. So to understand that better, we have to understand what kind of subnetworks do what kind of things. And people came up with this uh, um, uh, scheme now that there are many subnetworks, like uh, subnetworks that will determine the salience of the stimuli of what happened, including the internal stimuli, the auditory, visual, and other sensory stuff, but also things related to ventral attention, uh, which is just uh, kind of automatic. If something happens that draws my attention, but also the dorsal attention, when I want to pay attention to something, so it's it's voluntary. Uh, lots of things related to this. And then uh, it seems like information flow between the, these different subnetworks is controlled by the uh, uh, frontoparietal flexi flexible hubs. So, so people uh, have identified many of these networks. For example, if you don't do anything, you have activity in these two parts, basically. And this is called the default mode network. Your thoughts are about yourself, your situation, um, a relation with other people, work that you have to do, etc. But if you are focused on doing something, uh, the central executive network is is turned on and inhibits the default mode network. And then, then if something happens and this alliance network will determine that this is something you have to pay attention to, you have the activity in this this yellow regions here. Okay, so we thought that we cannot do it with the EEG because this is quite different type of signals that fMRI gives us. But in 2015, our friend uh, Jurek Boduk unfortunately died a few months ago. Uh, he was a director of a, of a, of a center in, in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, uh, has shown that actually you can, uh, by making a clever processing of EEG, you can extract similar activity uh, in the brain regions uh, as you can do with fMRI. And then several other people followed, and it, it, it seems like we know now how to get, it's still very difficult, but we know how to get this activity characterizing what happens in the brain. And to do that, you have to, well, go from sensors, from uh, the, the uh, electrodes that measure the signal uh, to sources. We have to recreate the pathways of signals and how it's, it's, it's changed, uh, it's mixed uh, when it goes through all kinds of tissues in the brain, the skull, et cetera. Uh, again, lots of mathematical uh, signal processing systems. Uh, Loretta is perhaps the most famous one. We've recently also published our own uh, toolbox uh, called SUPFUNSIM, which has some, at least theoretically, has some um, uh, very good properties. And we, we want to show that it is really better than others, <laughs> of course. And uh, we, we work on all kinds of uh, um, um, approaches to uh, brain fingerprinting, as it's called. And this is, we, we try to read um, information about what happens in the brain from EEG, from fMRI, um, and there are several approaches to, to, to this, like uh, analysis of microstates, uh, uh, task-dependent modes in fMRI, uh, what is called contextual connectivity, et cetera. So 
unfortunately, these networks are very dynamic. They change in time and depending on what you do. So for example, if you have to count from 100 by one, so 99, 98, et cetera, it's all automatic. So you see that, that, that then uh, there is lots of this uh, local activity in the default mode network because you can still think about yourself and it's got just, just counting goes on without much effort. But if you have to do more difficult things, that is you have to remember what was uh, two things back and then uh, react to them and then remember the next thing coming at the same time, then you see that the default mode network locally is not active because it's, it's a difficult um, task. This has been uh, shown by um, Karolina Fintz, who is in our group and has made, this was a part of her PhD. And uh, uh, when you look at, at uh, the same situation and look uh, how strongly things connect between the frontal and parietal and then uh, uh, other temporal and occipital brain areas, you, you see that in case of heart uh, task, uh, there, there are big activations and lots of information flows all over the brain. So this is a dynamical change depending on the cognitive load. And um, another thing is that if you train your memory, for example, this was based on six weeks training with a harder and harder working memory task, you find that the control people have not changed uh, almost at all. This yellow part is this frontoparietal synchronization network. But uh, those people who had to use their brain in hard situations where the frontal and parietal area have to synchronize uh, are here much more red, which means that there is more uh, brain areas which uh, became parts of modules synchronized together. And so, we have uh, uh, done quite a lot of analysis with fMRI and it has been just published uh, last uh, de December in Nature Communications. Uh, another approach is just to focus on brain region and look at the spectra uh, produced by the activity in there. This is called spectral fingerprinting. And uh, quite recently, uh, a paper appeared, unfortunately, we have not been the first to look at that, uh, where they could actually distinguish two subtypes of major depression and two subtypes of PTSD. And it looked like there is a subtype which is quite different and reacts in a different way to TMS, to, to this transcranial magnetic stimulation uh, procedures, et cetera. So, um, uh, we work on, on the packages that will allow us to analyze what happens in the brain. You can see here the recurrent uh, um, patterns, um, uh, plots, and then uh, based on the, um, the short-term uh, Fourier signals and then uh, the information flow here. So I hope we'll, we'll get the system running within the year. So just to finish, uh, neuroscience has now strong influence on artificial intelligence and HCI. And then uh, AI also is very important for neuroscience. Hasibis, who is the head of this uh, deep brain um, Google company, uh, has written with some colleagues uh, the neuroscience inspired artificial intelligence paper in the journal Neuron. Uh, Yoshua Bengio has written the consciousness prior <laughs> paper. Uh, so, so people talk about all these different things from the point of view of, of um, models and understanding what brains are doing. The long short-term memory that Jürgen Schmidhuber came up with is now providing insights for development of working memory, gating, maintenance, et cetera. So the language that neuroscientists use comes from uh, neural models. And then AI systems have been inspired by uh, understanding of neural models, visual attention, complementary learning systems, models of working memory, uh, and the neural Turing machine, um, synaptic consolidation, etc. So uh, people are creating systems which uh, have to well behave like the intuitive physics knowledge that we have uh, allows us to behave. Scene understanding, unsupervised learning, uh, one-shot generaliz generalization, uh, imagination of realistic 3D environments in deep neural networks, etc. Um, uh, monitoring the development of children and infants. This is what we've tried to do. Perception, working memory, curiosity, unfolding full potential of children. And then precise diagnostic of subtypes of mental disorders is within our reach. And that includes um, uh, all, all kinds of subtypes of schizophrenia, et cetera, which is a big problem because people have never been able, just looking at the symptoms to uh, diagnose that more precisely.
And uh, enabling early uh, diagnosis for autism is very important and other developmental problems. So, so we work on some of these things and um, especially the non-pharmacological approaches to various forms of pain management are going to be very important. And this is done through some neuromodulation. This is already done by neurosurgeons. They, they will put in your spine uh, a piece of electronics that will actually inhibit the uh, the um, uh, well spikes or the uh, signals coming from the nerves uh, through the lower part of the of the body. This is a big market. It's it just grows very quickly, and the estimations are that it can reach twenty seven billion dollars in about five years time. And closed loop neurofeedback for neurohabilitation is going to be very important. Targeting neuroplasticity and brain computer interfaces that will uh, be based on new forms of neurofeedback. And um, also, uh, there, there are a few people working on disorders of consciousness, trying to um, help people to get out of coma in, in, in the um, um, well hospicium that we that we have in, in Torin. Uh, there are applications in education, there are applications to improve your memory and lots of neurocognitive technologies for general optimization of brain processes, well-being, wisdom, entertainment, etc. So we've published quite a lot of things in the past uh, few years in journals like Nature Communication, Nature Protocols, Human Brain Mapping, Brain Imaging Behavior, Neuroinformatics and um, uh, Sensors and, and, and other uh, patterns uh, in other journals of this sort. This has been a part of the uh, big project that we have. Uh, which is called In Search of the Sources of Brain's, Neuro, uh, Brain's Cognitive Activity, and uh, which has been uh, run with people from Nensky Institute of Experimental Biology, who are really neurobiologists, uh, experts in the Institute of Physiology and Pathology of Hearing, uh, which are uh, in Warsaw and doing this cochlear implants, and uh, our Center for Modern Interdisciplinary Technology. So, Thank you for synchronizing your neurons. Uh, there is lots of other things that would, <laughs> I would like to tell you, but there is not much, much time to, uh, to go on. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think you can hear the, the, the great applause uh, here on site and probably a lot of uh, also virtual bravos uh, uh, to you. Thank you for this inspiring talk. Uh, I don't think there is a lot of people in our community that would like to experiment on the open brain, but uh, <laughs> we will surely <laughs> like to use your uh, your results into our uh, research. Uh, we have a time for, for discussion, so uh, first of all I would like to ask uh, participants uh, uh, on site for questions and on the other hand we will also copy and uh, read the questions from the uh, Zoom. So. Uh, any questions here? If not, but I will start. <laughs> uh, so, so you, uh, I have uh, maybe some more uh, philosophical questions. So, uh, you um, you told us that uh, neuroscience is very important for AI, and AI is again uh, very important for. Uh, for uh, neuroscience and uh, our decoding of our understanding of how our brains uh, function but i would like to uh, follow the the, um, uh, the idea that uh, our rectors uh, actually uh, as, as, uh, um, uh, posted <laughs> in the beginning so uh, we are living in the uh, applications of artificial intelligence coming into our daily lives how, uh, how do you think uh, can we use your results and maybe our uh, HCI community methods to, uh, to be sure that these AI technical uh, applications uh, would comply with our uh, human uh, rights, human expectations and uh, not to overwhelm uh, our human uh, feelings? What, do you, uh, what, do you, what can you say about this? Hmm. Well, the, the first thing is always understanding the processes behind uh, what we do. And if you understand them, for example, this, this very recent paper that I've mentioned that can distinguish different subtypes of PTSD, the uh, traumatic post disorder, and, and um, uh, also uh, major depression, etc. Uh, it, 
if we understand uh, how they differ from the point of view of what happens in the brain, we can actually have better intervention. But uh, but but your question is, is is quite general, of course, and it it relates to uh, well, um, how can we be sure that this is not going to be used in a harmful way? And of course, we cannot be sure. I mean, I don't know what the what the army is doing. <laughs> one one reason I'm very much interested in this is to uh, try to follow what is happening in the world because I see lots of danger. Uh, uh, for example, this idea that uh, you, you have all kinds of conspiracy theories that we can be controlled remotely. Uh, fortunately, we cannot yet be controlled remotely unless we have all these nanowires in our brain and uh, you know receivers and the rather complex equipment that that we will very easily notice. It's not something that you can inject into people <laughs> in any way. Uh, but it's something that can be used to, uh, for more effective brainwashing. Uh, and it's not very complex technique because uh, electric shocks have been used really to you know, change uh, the way people think uh, uh, because they can, they can induce new pathways in the brain. So, so uh, lots of danger is that uh, to understand them better, we have to watch what happens in the field. Uh, but I don't see how we can guarantee that the army is not going to use that in, in a bad way. And especially if we see what DARPA is doing, uh, DARPA is a very powerful organization. And of course, they say, OK, we want to train our soldiers faster. We want to you know, give them uh, better cognition so that they could do better analytics and other things like that. Uh, this is what they tell us. But what really happens, we don't know. So, 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 so I'm very much worried about potential military applications of some of this. I see very good things coming for uh, medicine and the, the idea that, that you, you may get sooner or later uh, um, a, a, a cup with electrodes plus, um, uh, plus um, a, a smartphone application that will allow you to um, um, uh, stop uh, addictions to stop a certain uh, compulsive behavior, etc., is very nice, uh, and we can probably, you know, treat lots of people. <laughs> but at the same time, uh, you don't know what uh, what other applications people will will will, will invent, right? So uh, there is there is no simple solution, I think, uh, in this in this area. As as all kinds of technologies. Um, it may have a very bad consequences that we have to watch. And as we know, especially in AI now, there is lots of activity to regulate certain uh, applications because you cannot regulate AI. I mean, it's like regulating mathematics, basically. AI is a, is a bunch of algorithms uh, and machine learning is just, just algorithms. So, so you can regulate specific applications uh, based on these technologies. Uh, and this is certainly before we get any uh, commercial devices. This is certainly something that has to be done. Uh, this European Union is very much interested in, and uh, there have been some um, documents already issued. Uh, we've been asked also to express our opinion on the ethics of AI and, and all these big projects that we have now in Europe in artificial intelligence, they're, they're basically uh, um, the uh, uh, related to ethics of, of AI. Okay. Okay. It, it doesn't sound really very optimistic, but, uh, but it means that we need to put a lot of effort into ethical part of, of our research. So, so I think this, this could be a, uh, one idea that should uh, stay with us. Uh, mm. I'm uh, taking a look into internet questions, but uh, I think we had some problems, so I don't have any questions from the internet for the moment. So, so uh, there is the last chance for you guys uh, on site to to ask a question. There is one question, so please use your power to. Uh, put power was the uh, Chinese University of Technology. I mean, I, so. Somewhere in the middle of your talk, you talked about, oh, there are those phenomena, but we still don't, we know that this works, but we don't know how it works. And it's funny enough, I, I saw the same slide when I was working with my colleagues in psychiatry, where they said the same thing is like, we have therapies, we know that therapies work, but we have no idea how, and we're not even close to how. So, you know, given that you've spent your career working with brains, do you think we can even ever understand those systems because you know this is an hci conference we like 
deterministic stuff, stuff that we can analyze. Do you think this is going to happen within our lives? Is it a hundred years? Is it a thousand years until we understand the brain? Well, I hope it's not hundred years because there is a big progress really in first modeling these processes and then uh, measuring these processes and verifying our ideas. Um, uh, but 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 it's true that in medicine it's so complex that we don't know how things work, right? Uh, I mean, all the pathways at the molecular level are are very difficult to trace, even for simple drugs. But still, people can now um, understand how viruses work, uh, simulate that, uh, simulate the parts that you can actually um, uh, disengage somehow. Um, in, in, in the case of the brain, my, my feelings are mixed in the sense that I see that when you look deeper, you see that it's a very complex 100 billion neurons connected together with 100,000 billion uh, uh, connections. It's incredibly complex. But um, when you look at that uh, in a very rough way, you see, okay, lots of experiments showing um, how different brain regions uh, activate in different task situations. So we kind of understand that the involvement of amygdala in the fear responses is a key. It's not that amygdala is, is creating fears. This is created by the whole brain network activity, but it is a key element. This is what, what we can do. And now the, the problem is that, that, that it cannot be uh, too much uh, 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 reduced to interaction of simple elements. It has to be holistic. Now, holistic means that, that, that at some point we'll see, okay, there are all these major brain diseases and it's kind of a continuous space. I, I talk a lot with uh, uh, people uh, uh, in uh, uh, epilepsy, um, in, in, in one of the big hospitals in Cincinnati in the US, uh, they claim that, that it's only half of different types of epilepsy that they try to diagnose and put into uh, specific subcategories. But it's all fiction because some people just want their names to be attached to certain things. And so they say, okay, this is this subtype I've invented and, and it's called with my name. But, but the fact is that this is a continuous uh, situation in which different parts of the brain to different degrees, different types of neurons, uh, regions, et cetera, uh, may actually uh, create a specific kind of epilepsy, which will have very different manifestations. And so uh, I, I envision the situation in which we will we'll just look at, at these holistic processes and say, okay, uh, this division is just very rough. And, and, and it, it's also connected to how we use the language to describe things which are continuous, basically. The continuous processes in the brain um, uh, that psychologists try to categorize. If, if you remember until 1972, psychologists just believe in memory. And then suddenly Tulvin came and said, oh yes, but the episodic memory, the autobiographical memory and the memory for facts, which is the semantic memory are two different things. And then they came up with this idea, yes, procedural memory is still a different thing. And then the recognition memory is quite different thing, right? So there are lots of brain processes which contribute to memory of something. And now we have 10 different forms of memory. So, so we try to use the language, which is more and more specific uh, uh, and is attached to a certain, uh, is, is connected to a certain brain processes. Can we, can we do that with, with the diseases and uh, understanding of general behavior? Um, only to some degree, I'm afraid. So, so we have to rely on simulations and systems that will simulate what brains are doing. And uh, then we can create better uh, human computer interaction, knowing uh, how the system will respond. And this is what people do in uh, molecular biology, where they have now simulations of microbes, very detailed, of all the metabolic processes, genetic processes, etc. And then they can simulate what will happen when a certain drug comes and changes that. Uh, this is the future, I guess. <laughs> Thank you very much once again. So uh, a last round of applause for Vodek. Uh, thank you, thank you very much uh, once again for joining us. Uh, actually in Poland, we uh, uh, 
traditionally are quite flexible, but uh, I know that the next uh, session uh, chair is from Germany, so we need to conclude <laughs> this opening uh, ceremony now. And uh, once again, thank you for joining us uh, virtually. Uh, I don't know if we have time for a coffee break. We will do 11.35 uh, back in here, so we'll, we'll have a 20 minute okay, delay, because so we have nice food for you guys. All right, so thank you very much. So we have a, a short break and we are back at uh, 11.35. 11.35 back in here, please. Thank you so much. Thank you.